Hey guys, Boris Lossberg. Welcome to the weekly technicals for August 1 through August 5, 2016. And of course, the past week was as turbulent as we had expected it to be. But I think the most surprising aspect of the whole thing, the biggest takeaway from last week, is that the dollar has just gotten very badly kneecapped across the board. The primary driver for dollar strength has always been this, this underlying assumption that the U.S. economy was doing better than the rest of the world, that the case for U.S. Fed, for the, uh, for the Federal Reserve Bank of New York to raise rates was far stronger than all the other central banks across the world. And that gave U.S. an interest rate advantage and the dollar um, a stronger bid. A lot of those assumptions got completely decimated last week, uh, especially at the end of the week with an incredibly weak GDP number. Now, the GDP number, you know, when you kind of sliced it and diced it, wasn't as bad as um, the headline number appeared. It came in at 1.2 against 2.6 expected. Most of the uh, sharp decline was due to inventory liquidation. The underlying spending strength of the U.S. consumer still remains relatively good. And there is a slow but certainly very steady um, uptick in, in inflation. Having said all this, none of it really matters because ultimately it gave the Fed a perfect excuse to stay on the sidelines at least, at very least, until December. Uh, remember, we've been trying to push off this um, this interest rate hike every single cycle. And now, of course, coming up into the U.S. election, which promises to be probably the single most polarizing partisan election we've ever had in the history of the country, or certainly uh, we've had in the last 50 years, the Fed is loath, loath to intervene um, policy-wise during the election season. The election season in the U.S. officially kicks off September, after after uh, Labor Day holiday in the U.S., September 8th. That's really when the full election uh, season goes in, in, in full swing, which means the Fed is very likely not going to do a blessed thing um, all the way through the uh, throughout the election season. And now with a very weak GDP number that came in on Friday, um, it gives them perfect cover. Um, even if the employment data this month, which comes out at the end of the week, um, is better than expected. Now, um, I'm just going to take a look and see what the expectations are for next. Um, I just want to make sure, but I think we you know we're, the the market is looking for, yeah, not even looking for much. Uh, market is only looking for 170,000 in payrolls. Even if we do 200,000 in payrolls, it's not going to matter. It's not going to be enough to move the needle to get the Fed to um, to become more hawkish. And I think that's the critical thing. The Fed has acknowledged the U.S. economy is doing better and still at the same time decided they're not going to do a blessed thing about it. I think that's the takeaway from this week's message. And that, of course, puts a dollar in a very, very weak position um, for the near term because it takes away the underlying reason for why you want to be long the dollar um, because of the expectation of forward action. That's always what happens in the market. Remember, the markets are always driven by expectation of forward action. Once we've taken that expectation away, it makes it extremely difficult to make a buying case. So now the dollar only becomes sort of a repository of euro dollar flows or pound dollar flows um, or yen uh, selling flows. We'll get to those in just a minute, but I think I think that's the key thing to sort of really um, understand and appreciate that the dollar is no longer a positive trade. It only becomes a negative trade, which makes it much, much more difficult to want to get long the pair. And in many ways, I think, creates a structure here where uh, it's pretty much sell the dollar across the board, um, which means that you're basically buying your dollar on dips, you're selling dollar yen on, on rallies, and you're buying pound dollar on dips, irrespective of what's going on internally on their own stories. Now, the stories that are going on in Europe are blah, but not horrendous. I mean, the, the Euros, Eurozone PMI is coming in relatively okay. There's really nothing going on in Europe. The, the, the sort of the single biggest worry in Europe is, is, of course, the Italian banking crisis. But the Italian banking crisis um, is kind of getting, for the time being, um, what should I use the word for? You know, camouflaged over, right? Painted over. Uh, they're putting a Band-Aid on the, on the Monte de Paschi, um takeover, and they're going to try to uh, recapitalize the Italian banks. And as long as they can just do that, I guess, for the next uh, several months, it's really not going to matter much. The, the ECB stands ready to make liquidity, but it's not at a point at a critical juncture here where it needs to make liquidity. So um, 
the euro, which, by the way, if you've noticed, has been in a measly 200-point range for pretty much the last 45 days, probably very likely going to stay within that range. I don't see more than 100 points either way from where we're at as far as moving in the euro. We'll go through all the ranges and, and, and uh, pairs necessary, but it still remains to be probably the lowest volatility trade amongst everybody in the majors. Dollar yen, a much more interesting story. So dollar yen was, of course, the central story this week. And the Bank of Japan came in with a thud and just basically all of the expectations for a major, major um, stimulation deal for a deal where they're going to do a huge amount of accommodation kind of fell flat. All they decided to do was buy more ETFs, no JGBs, no helicopter money, nothing on the table from the BOJ that uh, creates a truly unconventional monetary policy that would give reason for people to want to buy Dalian. So Dalian, of course, got sliced. And then it was a sort of a one-two combination. Um, not only did it get hurt by all the disappointment on the fact that Japanese weren't going to dilute their currency any further, it got hurt by the fact that U.S. wasn't going to uh, provide a, um, a reason to buy because, because of the slowdown in the U.S. GDP growth, which basically put the Fed on hold all the way until December. So dollar yen looks in a very, very weak position for the time being. There may be some knee-jerk um, reactions here into the uh, positive data from ISM. Um, positive data from payrolls, but all of it, I think, is essentially temporary. The much more critical thing, the only the only reason why I'm very, very leery, leery of shorting dollar yen at these levels is intervention, because we're getting to the level of $100 yen, and all of the Japanese officials have said it is impossible, it is impossible for them to escape deflation if dollar yen trades at 100 um, or below. So I think there's going to be some sort of a concerted effort here to try to want to push this higher. We also, of course, have this week Prime Minister Abe's announcement that um, that they're going to uh, create perhaps more fiscal stimulus. And if that's a story, that could provide a little bit of a lift. But still, in many ways, we'll take a look at the charts. Dollar yen remains um, a sell the rally trade. Um, it is not, however, a a short on a breakdown trade because I'm very much afraid of intervention risk and I think that's the danger that, that you could um, you could experience. I mean, you could probably trade it relatively comfortably till the parity level, but if it gets anywhere close to that, you could have a you know 300 point spike against you in a matter of seconds. That's why I'm very leery shorting the trade um, for non-market related reasons. Um, and the other story I think that's this bubbling up here is that the Brexit story is starting to filter away. Now, th this is going to be actually a good week to see just how bad the impact of Brexit has been. Because if you look at this, um, what's happening in UK right now, basically, is that I think Theresa May, the new prime minister, is doing everything in her power to want to completely forget the Brexit vote. Uh, whatever she says, whatever lip service she gives to, uh, to the general public, take a look at her actions and you see that she has zero interest in actually invoking Article 50, zero interest in actually decoupling UK from Europe, zero interest in actually pulling the trigger. And I think the market is sensing that. The market is sensing that, that basically Brexit is BS, to use um, uh, a more colloquial term. And um, because of that, uh, I think the, the, the tone now is going to be on whether the UK um, the economy can just kind of right itself and sentiment in, in business sentiment can kind of recover relatively quickly. We had a very, very hard hit, of course, um, on the PMI basis, on the flash PMI basis. This week we get all the PMIs. We get the construction, the uh, um, uh, the manufacturing, and of course the services PMI. And we'll have to see if there's any any chance of an uptick. I mean, let's just put it this way. That's, it's not that we're looking for positive data. It's just we're looking for less than horrible data. And if we get less than horrible data, there's a very strong chance, given the way cable is building up here, and I'll show you the charts, that we could have a nice clean move up to the 35s. So let's just take a look at the charts here before we, let's just take a look at the levels before we get to the charts here. And um, the levels have essentially, in Euro, the level, um, it's like Groundhog Day. I may just repeat myself a thousand times. It's, it's 10 to 12, 10 to 12. We are at the cusp of the upper end of this range. Can we break above it? Absolutely. But I think it's maybe 50 to 70 points above it, just like it was 50, 70 points below the tens that really kind of stopped the range. We'll take a look at the charts and I'll show you exactly why. Dollar yen, the, the peak 107.50 certainly was something we talked about that that was the that was the swing high and it's very unlikely we're going to exceed that in the near term at all. The really big level, of course, could be the hundred. We're at 102 right now. There'll be a lot of temptation to want to run the hundreds, but I think um, the hundred is going to be a very very volatile level. Of all the pairs that we have here, this still remains the most volatile pair because of this incredible political and economic, um, you know tug of war that we're having at this point in the dollar yen pair and cable has built a very nice solid foundation at 30 and i think if you look at the charts here the the key um, argument to be made is that this kind of a long buildup could very easily now lead 
to a run up to 135. Let's just take a look at charts here and let me show you what I mean. So let's take a look at the euro first. The euro dollar, uh, as I said, the post-Brexit low was around 0.950. Uh, the range was essentially 12 to the high, um, 10 to the low, and no 950 to the low. So let's just, you know, let's just sort of expand the range into the 50s. Let's say it's it's 112.50 to the highs, a 109.50 to the lows, and that's kind of where we're, you know, where we're going to be bouncing around. We're, we're, you know, within inches. We we came within like two or three pips of the 1200, came back down. Um, this may be sort of the end, top of the range. We'll have to see how the European data comes in. Uh, certainly, if the U.S. NFP numbers come in positive, this could break, bring us right back down. But it's it's still very much a range trade, and certainly anything above 12 to 12.50 is probably going to present itself actually as a relatively decent short, uh, but um, not as convincing as short as it used to be just a couple of days ago. Still, in the grand scheme of things, if you look at the uh, at the euro chart on a longer term basis, it's still a failure continual failure at, at um, a lower highs. Uh, the only key thing that would, that would give me a little bit more comfort is I'd like to see this fail. I'd like to see sort of, you know, the, um, um, the 1190, 1250 kind of fail before you'd want to you know, imagine a short. Or you could sort of run, in, you know, run a short into this against the 1350 range because if we kind of come up all the way up to the 1350, that would really invalidate the whole long-term euro to the downside thesis. For now, you're just looking for a tactical short entry because you're basically betting on the fact that you're going to have a lower high and yet another failure. But it's a low volatility trade, not a lot of action here, so trade accordingly. Dollar yen is, of course, a much, much more interesting trade here. So 107.50, clear failure. Um, this whole big rally, and remember I told you, yen is notorious for, for unwinding their big rallies. So this whole big rally um, started a couple of weeks ago on the speculation that the uh, Abbey administration was going to really, you know, accommodate hard and dilute the currency. It's unwound very hard and very fast over the last few days, and, and certainly unwound pretty much most of it actually on Friday by three big figures. The only thing that could make me positive yen is if we sort of stop over here, consolidate, and then you would have a series of higher lows, and you could have a potential move back up to the 105s. Still think the 105, 106 is very much the top of this move for the time being, but it's not inconceivable to think that, that you know, Abi could come up with some sort of a fiscal stimulus package plus positive U.S. NFPs could translate into a move higher. But we have to watch this very, very carefully. Um, certainly, once we start clipping into, in, in, into the one, uh, 100s here, it becomes a very, very dangerous territory, ripe for lots and lots of stop running. My fear, again, and this is the reason why I just think, I think it's relatively safe to short from 102 to 100 at this point. There may be just maybe another 50 points worth of downside action in yen. Um, and unless we get some more negative data um, along this week, more disappointment, it's probably going to find some sort of a bid. But I'm very leery, as I said, because the BOJ could come in and intervene. And that's that's something you simply can't handicap against. So in some ways, I guess the more intelligent trade here probably would be buying at this point on the hope that that um, sort of flow, positive flow on the U.S. side, positive flow on, uh, you know, positive noises out of the Abbey administration could stymie this, this big correction. We could have a higher low um, and therefore a potential move back up to 105s. Um, and then last but not least, so, so you know, it's, it's, it's a sort of a short-term buy but a long-term sell because a lot, if we get above here, it just doesn't have a lot of juice, I think, to go to the upside. Pound dollar has been very interesting because I've been watching this really for the last month. And you've noticed the 130 has just been not touched. We've come up to 131 more than once, more than twice, more than three times, and has not been touched. And this has not created a very, very strong base. So all you need is just less than horrible data out of UK. And I think you get a squeeze back up. And a squeeze back up could possibly go all the way up to the 135, which is the very, very big resist level from the multi-year breakdown that we had post-Brexit. So to me, cable looks to be like a very interesting buy point at this, uh, at this level. And that actually um, creates, in my opinion, some converse cross trades, trades that we've been trading to the long side for a long time um, with Euro pound um, especially may now become, I think, very interesting possibilities for the short for the short trade. Be watching that very carefully. I think it's going to create a lot of volatility over the next two weeks on the cross side. We'll discuss that in the cross section. But in the meantime, I like the pound to the long side as long as 130 holds. Um, I guess I like the yen to the long side because I certainly don't want to take it to the short side because I'm afraid of intervention risk. And, and, and you kind of hope that, that this is, creates a higher low with a potential move to the 105. And the euro really is just a, you know, a blah trade either way. But I suppose you could start to lay out potential shorts here in the, in the 112 region looking for a, yet another fail and a move to the downside. But it's still a very low volatility trade. And, and unless you're day trading like we do in our, in our, in our chat room, 
I have zero interest in actually swing trading this particular pair. So that's how the week shapes up. Obviously, we're going to watch um, all the data set that's coming out, especially the non-farms payrolls at the end of the week. But the 100 level in the end is the critical level. The 130 in the pound is critical level to the downside, 130 to the upside. In the 135 to the upside in the, in the pound and 105 to the upside in the yen. With the uh, euro, it's still the 110, 112 range, boring as ever, but um, that's how the trade goes. Wish you guys the best of luck, the best trading. Boris Lonsberg, over and out.